What's going on, y'all? Hope everybody's doing good. I know it's been a little crazy. Um, but look, we're going to get into it. Uh, today, we're going to talk about women, and I'm going to share the screen with you real quick. Get straight to it. Uh, if we look at the syllabus real quick, I do recommend that you go in and check out the Centoya Brown interview because this interview is basically showing the story of Centoya Brown, who when she was she was 16 years old when she was incarcerated, um, she was being human trafficked, um, and basically she was in a situation where she was in a room with a 40 plus year old man. She said, according to her, that um, the man had a gun and that he was reaching for it and she reached it, reached for it first and shot him in the chest. She, she said that she threaded for her own life or threaded for her own life. Um, but essentially, the main takeaway is that she was 16. She committed, um, you know, she, she took somebody's life basically and she was basically being forced and to do life in prison. And this sat wrong in the hearts of a lot of people. It wasn't until certain celebrities like Rihanna, LeBron James, and Kim Kardashian put it on the spotlight where a lot of people became aware of it. Um, and then basically people started reaching out to the governor of Tennessee, calling, sending correspondences saying, hey, you gotta grant her clemency, this, this, and that. Um, and basically she, she just finished serving about a decade um, and now she's back out in the community after, you know, that public uproar. But the reality is, if it wasn't for the celebrity influence and support that she got, uh, she there's, there's a pretty good chance she would not be out in the community at this point. Because um, the thing is, she was 16 and she was basically treated as an adult um, when she was being sex trafficked. And the thing is, it was illegal for the, the man that was with her obviously to have relations with her because he was a, a, a full blown adult already and she was still a minor, but uh, that's why a lot of people felt type of way. So I do recommend that you check out that video if you wanna learn about the criminal justice system as it relates to women and sex trafficking. Now to get into the lesson. So we're gonna get into this right here, this NPR uh, story. Story in general, you could listen to the four minute podcast that they have right there. Um, but basically, there are over 100,000 incarcerated, incarcerated women in the United States, so 111,616, a sevenfold increase since 1980. Some of these women are pregnant, but omitted, but omitted reports of women giving birth in their cells or shackled to hospital beds, prison, and public health of officials have no hard data on how many incarcerated women are pregnant or on the outcomes of those pregnancies. Now, one of the main differences between men and women during their incarceration is that obviously women can get pregnant. Um, a lot of women, a lot of women, of course, go in, you know, to their, their bed being pregnant already. They could be maybe a few weeks or, you know, they go in when the bump isn't noticeable yet. Um, but then the other side of it is that there are women, of course, who get pregnant while they're behind bars because they have relations with a correctional officer or some kind of employee, you know, from, from the department, which is obviously illegal, is wrong, um, and they could lose their job for that. When something like that does happen, um, the officer or whoever the employee is would get hit with or rape because legally, um, a detainee or somebody who's incarcerated, they cannot legally consent. Um, and this goes down to the idea of once somebody's incarcerated, they're basically considered state property. So if I pull this cup right here, I say, yo, cup, can I go outside? This cup can't tell me nothing. Like, you know, it can't consent to anything. Or, you know, if I, if I say, yo, cup, can I put you over there? I'm not going to hear nothing back. It can't consent. So that's kind of how a convict is treated as well. Somebody who's incarcerated, um, your state property, property can't tell you you could do this or that. Like it's just not, it's just not a thing. Um, and so once obviously sexual relations happen in that capacity, it's like the um, the official basically ends up committing 
committing rape. Um, so when we talk about women and just the overall numbers of them, a study published in the American Journal of Public Health basically showed the study included 57% of the U.S. prison population, New York, California, Florida, they were not included, but it found that 3.8% of newly admitted women were pregnant and that in a, in a single year, incarcerated women had 753 live births, 46 miscarriages, four stillbirths, and 11 abortions. So, of course, the majority end up giving birth, uh, but then there's the cases where, unfortunately, there's miscarriages, stillbirths, and, um, and abortions. And now, all of these obviously come with their, how do I say, like with their, with their baggage or with their issues in a sense, because oftentimes women, they already don't receive the medical attention that they need or the health attention that they need while they're behind bars. Um, specifically, once a woman is going through her menstrual cycle and things of that nature, how often they receive pads and, you know, things of that nature, that's, you know, that it, it usually takes a while. Um, and so the hygiene in regards to women and obviously staying away from getting infected and stuff like that, it becomes difficult because the facilities um, are not necessarily jumping at the opportunity to support women in such ways. But then when they give, when women are pregnant and they're about to give birth, of course, they try to, you know, in, in a lot of cases, try to take the woman to a hospital. But you do have cases where women just give birth right there in this, in this cell um, or in the jail. You have, you know, even the women that get taken to hospitals, they're basically laying up on the bed and they have uh, um, handcuffs around the ankle, you know, cuffed up to the bed. So it's like the process of giving birth is already an extremely stressful one. Um, just add the stress of not having the mobility and flexibility to now give birth, you know, freely because you're basically chained up to a bed. Um, and then of course, it, when you have complications like miscarriages and things of that nature, it's like, that just makes the overall jail experience even worse because that's not something you necessarily plan for. Um, I mean, obviously there's cases where people may try to hurt themselves or whatever, just to like, you know, try to finesse or whatever. Um, in those cases, I'd be interested to see how they classify those. Was it an abortion? Was it a miscarriage? What have you? But um, the reality is that the prison system and the jail system is not necessarily accommodating when it comes to women and pregnancies. And so that's just a reality, unfortunately. Um, and of course, women right after giving birth go through um, you know, they, they go through uh, emotional roller coasters and uh, depression and things of that nature. And that's just part of the natural process of after giving birth. And so you're on a, on a, on a, regular, on a regular day, just a woman who's not even incarcerated, it's already difficult to make it through the day sometimes because of all the, um, you know, hormonal imbalances happening and things of that nature now. Just imagine a woman going through that and then just add the stress of being incarcerated. That obviously just makes the whole experience that much more difficult. According to the sentencing project, basically the numbers throughout the years as, as stated before, um, in regards to women and, and incarceration has increased. Um, you have almost a balance of women in jails and in prisons. We could see that it's multiplied by several amounts since then. And a lot of that could be, you know, now women since then have been able to, um, to have more liberties, more freedoms. So that means that there might be more opportunity for crime or it could also be, you know, the system perhaps, does, like it has less, fears of pursuing women in a specific kind of light or in a specific kind of way. Um, out of the, the women that do get put under some kind of supervision as well, a great, a great majority of them are going to end up on probation. Now, that's true also of just the criminal justice system in general because 
we talk about people behind bars, but the reality is that there's more people under um, state supervision than anything, just on parole and probation. So um, if you're talking about parole and probation combined in the US, there's over 4 million people on it, where behind bars, you got just a little over 2 million, but everything together is a little over 6 million. Um, basically, you see the same thing for women. If we're talking about race, race and ethnicity, um, Basically, in 2017, the imprisonment rate for African-American women, basically for every 100,000 women, uh, there were 92 who were incarcerated, which was twice the rate of imprisonment of white women, so 49 for every 100,000. Hispanic women were imprisoned at 1.3 times the rate of white women, 67, per every, uh, 67 versus 49 for every 100,000. Um, Female imprisonment by race and ethnicity. So we could see for black women, it actually has declined throughout time, um, little by little, but for white women, it's kind of stood at a standstill a little bit. And then for, well, it's actually gone up a little bit for white women. And then for Hispanic women, um, it's pretty much been kind of at a standstill. Now, that could be for different reasons. The number on, on white women, of course, you have the opioid epidemic now happening. Just like in the crack era, um, people were being incarcerated because they had health-related issues with, you know, substance abuse and stuff like that. Of course, you know, the white community is the one that got impacted the hardest by that, so that's going to include white women. So I assume that that may be part of the reason, but there's so many things that one can break down from this. If we look at imprisonment rates by gender, race, and ethnicity, uh, basically from 2000 to 2017, for white women, there was a 44% increase. Um, if you're talking about per every 100,000, so basically 34 women to 49 women in, in 2017, so it actually increased per every 100,000 women. Uh, for white men, it actually decreased. For African-American women, it, it, it decreased by 55%, right? So basically, for every 100,000, it dropped from a little over 200 to a, to a little under 100. Uh, for black men, it has de decreased as well. And for Hispanic women, it has increased by 10%. And for Hispanic men, it has decreased by 14%. And so over here, when we look at the variations per every 100,000 uh, people, or every 100,000 women by state. You can look at the top, Oklahoma's at the top. You see South Dakota, you see Missouri, Wyoming, Texas, Tennessee, Nevada, uh, Montana, you know, Indiana, Georgia, Oregon. Um, and then basically, once you start going further low, you start seeing states more out in the east or like quote unquote liberal states like uh new jersey or massachusetts and stuff like that they're closer to the bottom so we can see a trend here a lot of these states they're out midwest um basically showing that the culture in some of these other states uh where maybe there might not be as much opportunity for women to like progress economically and things of that nature they still see more maybe as a housewife or what have you um incarceration is is just different the rates over there you know so you you have more incarceration for women in those areas um than in quote unquote more progressive liberal types types of states um if we're talking about offenses by gender in states in, in state prisons um women commit less violent crimes than men I think that's a, a given men are just amped up in a lot of cases and are ready to just, you know what I'm saying, let all that testosterone blow. Um, property, women are a little higher than men. You know, that could be maybe from like relationship related stuff, like slashing somebody's tires or, you know, stealing something or, you know, something of that nature. Um, drugs, now a lot of people are not aware, but like women, Women make pretty 
good drug dealers in the sense that they can be a lot more incognito. Obviously, women are able to have per have purses on them, and it's not seen as suspicious. Um, women are going to see, you know, are, are more persuasive with their words. They could probably talk themselves out of being arrested or something of that nature. Um, but then they also oftentimes carry drugs for their boyfriends or, you know, for somebody that they know. Um, a lot of people talk about Paulo Escobar and El Chapo, but they don't talk about Griselda Blanco, who she was basically the Pablo Escobar, like she, she was basically like the, like the woman Pablo Escobar. And she had created um, a brassiere that basically was able to allow women to, to uh, you know, basically just smuggle drugs through there in a way that, that was efficient. So, you know, and then you got public disorder at the end as well. And then last but not least, uh, if we're talking about incarcerated girls, girls of color are much more likely to be incarcerated than white girls. Uh, the placement rate for all girls is 47 per every 100,000 girls. For white girls, the rate is 32 per every 100,000. Native American girls, uh, you're talking about 134 per every 100,000, which is a lot. So they're, they're at the highest in regards to rates. And African American girls, 110 per every 100,000. Um, and Latina girls at 44 for every 100,000. So basically, you know, it, it, it's, it's just running through some of the statistics to show you how incarceration affects women, especially in the urban environment, because um, as we've discussed in class, in many different sessions, there's just a target put on the communities of color. And, and as we saw, Native and black communities are pretty much, you know, like per, per their own population, um, make up a large portion of people incarcerated, you know, percentage wise from within their own population. So now if we talk about trafficking, right, basically the, the tra trafficking of human lives, which is basically modern day slavery, like this is like the closest thing to literal modern day slavery that we still experience in the United States. Like, like you know, we could say different things as slavery and, in, in, and I would agree, like for example, mass incarceration and stuff like that, like those things, they're blatantly exploit, exploiting loopholes and amendments to basically continue slavery, but in a different fashion. But if we're talking about literal, literal slavery, like taking somebody from their family, um, beating somebody against their will, killing somebody, you know, for not doing what you're telling them to do. Um, the, the, what's it called? Sex trafficking is like the closest version of that that we see even in the, in the U.S. So human trafficking wasn't illegal until 2000 when the Trafficking Victims Protection Act was passed, which made it a federal crime. So the U.S. was pretty late with this. Um, the reality, Sue, is that the reality, too, is that there were a lot of politicians and wealthy individuals who were indulged in this. So it's like, if you're a politician, does it make sense for you to pass an act that you are clearly benefiting from? I mean, it wasn't that long, you know, from, like, this was around the Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky scandal where, yeah, you know, she did it voluntarily, but it just showed the nature of, you know, the, the sexual nature even of politicians. Like there was a governor in New York, I forgot his name, but he um he had basically worked to assist in sub in sex trafficking, uh, but he ended up getting caught up in a prostitution ring himself. Even I think it was last year, the year before, Robert Kraft of the the owner of the new New England Patriots, um, he's a billionaire. He had gotten caught up, you know, in some prostitution stuff. So and I'm saying prostitution because in a lot of cases, prostitutes um, were sex trafficked. You know, they were, they were uh, kidnapped, they were stolen, they were basically removed from whatever environment was known for them and then basically forced into a life of labor of selling their bodies um, un unwillingly. The United States, along with Mexico and the Philippines, was ranked one of the world's worst places for human trafficking in 2018. This is all on Business Insider. Um, 
In the U.S., there is no official number of human trafficking victims, but estimates place it in the hundreds, hundreds of thousands. I don't know why it's not showing the pictures, but since 2007, more than 49,000 cases of human trafficking in the U.S. have been reported to the National Human Trafficking Hotline, which receives an average of 150 calls a day. The most human, the most human trafficking cases have been reported in California, Texas, and Florida, according to hotline uh, to the hotline. Las Vegas is also a hot spot due to the city's culture and high rates of homelessness. But every state in the U.S. has reports of human trafficking. New York and Queens, in particular, is is a documented destination for trafficking because of its location on the Eastern Corridor, as well as being close to rural areas like Vermont. Um, as Homeland Security Assistant Special Agent Akil Baldwin told AM New York, New York is the epicenter of everything legitimate and illegitimate. And it is estimated that between 18,000 and 20,000 victims are trafficked into the U.S. every year. More than, 30, 000, more than 300,000 young people in the U.S. are considered at risk of sexual exploitation. Um, yeah, because children are more vulnerable than adults, you know. I don't know if y'all seen that video last year. There was that girl that she pretended like, like she got kidnapped, like right in front of her mother in the BX. And like the whole world just got mad at her because like, why would you do that? You know what I'm saying? But stuff like that does really happen. So that's why I created such an alarm for people. Um, I'm trying to get into some statistics. Children in, in two th children raising foster care have a greater chance of becoming victims. In 2013, 60% of child victims of the FBI, 60% uh, of child victims the FBI recovered were from foster care. In 2017, 14% of the children reported missing were likely victims of sex trafficking and 88% of those had been in child welfare. A 2014 study of sex trafficking by the Urban Institute, a Washington think tank, found 71% of labor trafficking victims entered the U.S. legally. All right, so this is just to give you some general stats and figures and things of that nature. Um, obviously, it's not just as simple as reading statistics, but I just want you to kind of grasp some general things. This is off of USA Today. And I'm reading off of this was an article written last year. There are more than 4 million victims of sex trafficking globally. 99% uh, are women and girls. There are no official estimate. There's no official estimate of sex trafficking victims in the US. Because it's like, how do you really keep track of that? You can't, you know? Because if a, if a woman reports that she's being trafficked, like she puts herself at risk and potentially is going to get killed, you know, as a result of discovering. And the thing is, because politicians and government officials and even police get involved in, in these kinds of circles and rings, um, it makes it more complex to, it makes it more complex to basically come forward and say, hey, look, I'm a victim of, of sex trafficking. Seven in 10 victims were exploited in Asia and in the, in the Pacific region. One in seven reported runaways in the U.S. in 2018 is likely a victim of child sex trafficking. Girls in foster care are particularly vulnerable, so we went over that. Profits from forced sexual labor are estimated at $99 billion worldwide. Profits are highest per sex trafficking victim in, in developed economies. So that would be like, um, so like the numbers. Yes, yeah, so like, like the economies that have more development happening, basically the funds would be higher there. Um, there are an estimated 9,000 9, illicit massage parlors across the US. Profits from the illicit massage parties are estimated at 2.5 billion. Events like the Super Bowl increasingly are monitored for sex trafficking. So, you know, 
right now it's kind of up in the air because there's two sides of it, but there's been a lot of conversation that um, supposedly the Super Bowl is like the top day for sex trafficking to happen. And, you know, it, it makes sense to, to a degree because you have so much activity, so much people, you know, so many people going out and, you know, going to malls and, you know, crossing highways and doing all this stuff, you know, just in preparation for this event. Um, and, you know, basically they, they, they try to, they try to make a maximum effort to just enjoy what their overall experience is. Um, yeah, hold up. Prosecution of sex trafficking. Give me a second, I'm gonna make another video. <laughs> 